myself and Thomas as well, my brother, mm-hmm. we weren't the kids when we were younger that were like destined for the Olympics, that we were talking about it all the time, that that was our dream. Um, it was something that kind of came as a result of sticking with it long enough and kind of just progressing and slowly but surely. Well, how are you, Jess? I'm good, thanks. As I said, sorry for keeping you waiting. It's always when you're under pressure that everything stops working. Zoom, internet, I was like, oh. But yeah. It's, it's come on, I'm used to it anyway. Um, <laughs> how's your day anyway? My day has been fine. Um, yeah. I to work on a Monday. So it's Monday tends to be my catch-up, house admin, groceries, cleaning. Okay. I get you. Adult things that I know. Mm. So, yeah, it's been fine. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, so. Yeah. Sorry, what, what were you going to say? How was yours? Oh, great. I got, um, I got a cheeky haircut today from one of my friends. Um, oh, very uh, good. What, what do you think? Doesn't look messy. It looks like you could have paid for it. Thank you. I'll take that. I'll take <laughs> that. But, um, but anyway, just have you, have you ever been into a podcast before? Yes, I have done, but I haven't done a podcast that has been video recorded. So okay. I've, done, I've done a few that have been online, um, but not one that's been on video. That's okay. Fine. Well, so basically my podcast is basically about self-development and well-being and all that stuff. And ever since I started the podcast, I, I actually kind of blend in sport with it as well. So you actually the perfect candidate to be on my podcast because you are related to psychology and sport as well. So I really appreciate you being in today's podcast. Um, oh, uh, no worries. I have a bunch of questions that I want to get straight into, but my first one really is, um, I, actually, before I get into the first question, like, I just want to say like psychology is something that I actually want to, like I'm studying strength and conditioning at the moment, but somewhere down the line, I actually want to study a bit of psychology. So most of the question uh, that I'm going to ask you will come from a psychology standpoint. point. So my first question for you is, it's going to be, at what point did you decide to become a sports psychology? Did you go through a phase um, as an athlete? Did you read a book and something resonate mm-hmm. with you? So what's the story? Where, where, did, where did that come from? Yeah, so I suppose it was one of those things. I always knew I wanted to do psychology. Um, even when I was younger, it was one of those things that my parents just, they just said, yeah, when you're about 15, you just started saying, yeah, I think I want to do psychology. I think it was around a time when there was a show called, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was where they followed, it was a child psychologist. He was quite famous. Okay, yeah. And they followed a group of kids who had from birth right through. And I think it's still going on. It's kind of like a study, but they had a TV show. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds so interesting. Child psychology. And then I did a TY, my transition year project was on psychology and was more on body language, which was more pop psychology, unfortunately. It's not really mm. like a career in, but it was just something that I was really interested in. I knew I always wanted to work with people. Um, I didn't see myself in an office. And then as my kind of my career in athletics progressed, it just makes sense to marry the two. So I did an undergrad in psychology. So if anyone is looking to get into sports psychology, it's something I, something I get asked a lot. My recommendation is always, do the undergrad psychology, then go on to do the sports psychology masters, which is what mm. I, um, yeah, it was just one of those things when I was in college, I did the psychology, but I was always that we didn't have any sports psychology modules in it when I did it in UL, but okay. I finally a project, my thesis in sports psychology. So I went to the P and sports science department and talked to some of them to get ideas about what would be a good project. And yeah, I just kind of took it on from there. So it's not a very well defined career path, unfortunately. Um, so it is a case of talking to people. It's not something that you say, oh yeah, I'm going to go to UCD and do my sports psychology. Mm. I kind of have to do a bit of research as to where I can go because there's not that many masters. There's more than now than when I was younger, but, mm-hmm. um, and it's not a very clear cut career path that even when you have your degrees, what your career will look like. I'm still figuring that out, unfortunately. But, but at least you're enjoying it though, aren't you? I love it. I really do. Yeah. I love it. Okay. It's, it's the two things that I love is working with people, working in sport. So to, you know, to apply the two things that I love in one thing and make a job out of it, I was very lucky. Daily. So how, like, how did that help you in your everyday life? Did you learn more about yourself since you've been into the psychology industry? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's funny, 
even though I'm working as a sports psychologist, I never went to see a sports psychologist as an athlete, mm. which doesn't really make sense. Um, it's something that I always said, oh yeah, I will do. And just kept putting it off. It's not that I didn't believe in it. Okay. Yeah. I was kind of like, oh, I'm studying it. I don't really need to. But it's like a doctor is saying, I don't need to go to the hospital because I'm studying medicine. You know, it's mm. it, it yeah. work that way. And I'm only looking back now and seeing how much I could have benefited from it. Um, the psychology degree I found really interesting just to learn about just general behavior and how people behave. Um, and even around COVID and everything, now, there's so many things that I would have learned back in first year, you know, around social mm. psychology and how people behave and how important, you know, social connectedness is. And I'm like, yeah, I got, I learned that in like my first module. Um, so it's like stuff like that comes back. And at the time, I don't think I, I think I just saw it as something I had to do. Whereas like, I, it was such an interesting degree when I look back. And the mm -hmm. psychology degree has been so valuable because it's a before, like I'm a performance psychologist. So it's not just sports specific. It's, you know, my fiance is a orthopedic surgeon and he, I'm giving him some tips about how to prepare for. Okay. Right. And how to prepare for, cause that's what they do. They perform a, a surgery. So, you know, it's learning how to set goals, learning how to kind of, I suppose, look at things from a different part, you know, a different perspective. A different perspective. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so no, look, it helps me massively. I could sit here all day and say all the reasons it does, but I'm I'm here to help other people more so, but I definitely have benefited as well. I get you. But, you know, I'm glad you mentioned, like, I like how you say you want to help other people, but mm -hmm. my next question is going to be, I want to I want to take you back, actually, okay? So imagine, mm -hmm. imagine Jesse, the hurdler back in the day. What mm -hmm. would she say to you, to Dr. Barr today, and what would be Dr. Barr's response to her? You know what, there's a time where, I suppose when I was early on um, in athletics, I didn't have a huge amount of confidence. Um, I kind of just went with it. And as I got better, I just kind of went with it. I didn't set goals for myself. Like, you know, I'll always say that myself and Thomas as well, my brother, mm -hmm. we weren't the kids when we were younger that were like destined for the Olympics, that we were talking about it all the time, that that was our dream. Um, it was something that kind of came as a result of sticking with it long enough and kind of just progressing and slowly but surely. And if I was to look back now, I would, you know, I'd probably, I would tell that Jesse to have a bit more confidence and kind of, you know, give it more of your attention. Because when I was in college, I was kind of right, okay. it was good, but I wasn't brilliant. So I didn't see it as a career. So I yeah, like, so but, I it, give it more time. So, but, but when you say be more confident, how how can someone be more confident because confident is a very vague term to be honest with you when you tell someone to be confident like i'm sure everybody wants to be confident but like yeah. they don't know how so yeah. how so how would you break confident down into simpler terms so i suppose confidence the wrong one for me back then it would probably would have had more belief in my ability because okay. i always compared myself to other athletes i trained in very which was a really really strong club at our age, at junior level, underage level. So every time we trained, it was like li lining up at a national championships. So I was always comparing myself to the best in the country. So I kind of thought, well, I'm not as good as them, so I'm not good. And I think I didn't have that self-belief. Now I stayed with it because I loved it. And I loved, the, you know, getting better. And I loved the social aspect. And I'm glad I had that. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have stayed with it if I was in it for mm -hmm. just success. But I probably would have told myself, have more, a bit more self-belief that, just because you're not as good at these girls now, there's, you know, there's still time. And it's that kind of growth mindset. Just because you're not good now, it doesn't mean you can't be good. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. you're not born fast, but you can work at it. And I think maybe I just saw it as like, oh, I'm just there better than me. And that's fine. I'm, I'm destined to always be in their shadow and that's okay. And just kind of accepted that. And um, maybe I would look back and say, you know, have a little bit more belief in your ability and the ability that maybe is there to be, to be kind of found out, which eventually it was. Um, okay. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, but it's, I think next week it's going to be a year since you announced your retirement. Um, yeah. What is it? Yeah. I, somewhere around June. I think it was You've done 17 of June. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. remember the day I announced, like I'd already had decided it, but that was the day it was kind of made public. But is there any voice in the back of your head that keeps telling you just to just give it to, just give it one more shot? 
Um, there always is, but yeah. I, after I didn't qualify for Rio, I just had a terrible year that year. I, um, I had had a, the best training year of my life in 2015, picked up an Achilles tendon injury, um, just coming back from warm weather training. So that was the year, 2015 was like the year I was like, I'm going into this season, I'm going to be breaking you know, I was kind of like, okay, maybe not the Irish record this year, but that's going to fall to me if I keep training the way I'm going now. Mm. And it just didn't happen. And then I tried again for Rio and that didn't happen. And then I tried to come back in 2017. I came back, you know, or in 2016, September, I came back and I was just, I'd lost the love for it. It just kind of really worn me down, not getting to Rio. So I took a break, came back and fell into this really nasty cycle that a lot of athletes probably can, that can, can relate to. Yeah, that that kind of injury, rehab, trying to get back, getting back, picking up, Mm. falling back and never really getting to a stage where I had consistent training. Um, And it was just stripping the love away for for me. A long break again. And in 2018, September 2018, I said, okay, this is September where I'm going to come back. There's going to be, there'll be, there was a new track in UL laid and I was like, perfect, good timing. I'll come back when that's ready in September. And within three weeks, I picked up a calf, like just a strain. But I was like, you know what? I can't do it. Just can't do it anymore. And it was a really hard decision because I loved it and I wasn't ready to finish. I knew I have more in me. And Mm -hmm. even sometimes, even the other day, I was kind of got a little bit upset talking to Paul and my fiance, just kind of like, oh, God, how different could things be now if those years hadn't happened and you know, what my career look like, but then I probably wouldn't be in the career I am as a sports psychologist. So timing wise, it also did work out. So, but it's okay. so easy to always look back. So do, God, if you were to put me in a pair of spikes and tell me, yeah, you're still able to run a 50 something second over the hurdles, I would take your arm and all, but it's just, it was the, how much I had to put into it to get so little return. And it got to a stage where I had to pick between a career that was going somewhere as a psychologist. I get you. Yeah. 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 And then let that career that was going nowhere. Yeah. Like it's good. Like, you know, yourself more than, more than anybody, you know, how you feel, you know, the injury that you have anyway, but like mm-hmm. a lot of people from the outside, uh, sees the wonderful career that you have. You went to Beijing, you went to Rio, but my, my next question to you is what trait, that you think not like in, in, your, in your opinion just not not on the outside just for you what what traits do you think you possess to make you who you are today yeah it's something that I've I've thought about a lot and I think something that I definitely had was resilience because okay. I, the times when I was injured and I went to the pool and I did my aqua jogging and I got up on the bike and I did my horrible bike sessions when I knew everyone was on the track and the training I wanted to do watching race after race going by, wondering what could have been if I had been in good shape. Um, but I kept coming back and I just okay. didn't let, because after I competed in London, I kind of had my heart set that I was like, yeah, I've competed in London. I've done the relay. In four years, I'm going to be in Rio and they're doing the hurdles and I'm going to be doing them well. I didn't mm-hmm. really cross my mind that wasn't going to be the case. So that four years, nothing stopped me. Every, no matter what was thrown at me, like I got into a, I crashed my car. Like my fault, I went into the back of someone, unfortunately, but I came out worse from it in May of 2016. So I'd ran my first race in two years. And within a week, I had crashed my car and was in a boot. <laughs> and I was like, I'm still going to be on the plane to Rio. It's going to happen. Now, mm-hmm. I could look at that and say naive, and it was dogged, determinedness. But that was, I would see that as a resilience that I was like, I've set my goal and I can't let any doubt creep in. Because if I do, I'm going to pull the foot off the off the accelerator. Right. It's really only when the day the team was announced that, and I knew I was never going to be there. I, I didn't get to the, the at the national championships. I pulled up with a Achilles pain, so I knew it wasn't going to happen. But it was only when it was officially announced that I said, "Real's not happening." Okay. Because I had that goal for four years, and I'd say you know I definitely made me resilient. It made me quite probably had a bit of like a large chip on my shoulder for a long time and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, but it's definitely something that I've held on to that kind of resilient and that kind of nice. this kind of thing will pass and I can take something from this I can learn something from this experience 
But Jess, do you think most athletes should have that resilience? You should, do you think most elite athletes should have that trait of resilience? Or is that, or is that something hard to teach, to teach someone? No, I think any athlete can have it. Like resilience is not something you're born with. There's like a lot of talk about this idea of mental toughness, resilience. Mm. They're all kind of in the same. Class. I was I was gonna get into that. Yeah, you got. Yeah. yeah. So resilience is basically the idea of having a set, having something go wrong, and mm-hmm. coming back from it, and coming back, you know, coming back to a similar place you were, or maybe better, and right. having something from it. So it's not just that idea of just bouncing back, but sometimes it's better, <clears throat> or it could be seen as just taking something positive from a setback and using that in your journey forward. Um, so it might not be that that resilience gets you back to where you were. For me, that resilience after Rio didn't get me back on the track to where I was, but it did probably teach me a lot about myself and probably help me reflect on times where I kind of think, you know what, I do fall into a trap of trying to place the blame on other people where actually, you know what, there were times. Okay, yeah. And I think I learned that about myself, that it's very easy to try and find a scapegoat when you're upset. And I did try to do that a lot. I tried to say, oh, you know, if, if we hadn't gone here, if that track had been better in UL. Or, and I'm like, no, no, you could control for all those things. You knew those things were there. And it was very, it's very easy to get into that mindset. So even though the resilience didn't get me back on the track, it probably helped me cope with how I felt about those couple of years. So, yeah, I think any athlete... Any athlete who has had a setback, big or small, can develop resilience from that. And it's, I suppose it's in the process of reflecting on it, kind of reflecting on what happened. Uh, was it in my control? If it was, how could I, the next time I'm in a situation like that, could I do it better and make it mm-hmm. work for me? And if it wasn't in my control, um, how can I learn from it? Um, and what, what are the things that I can take from that situation about myself or whatever it is? So you know, any athlete can develop that resilience and it's just recognizing a setback as a learning opportunity or a failure as a learning opportunity. Hard thing to do. We all say it, you win or you learn, but that's kind of where that resilience will come. It's a harsh truth, yeah. Yeah, and it's not something people want to accept. It's like, yeah, no, I just want to win all the time, but in sports, you don't win more. You don't win as much as you lose or you don't win as much as you have poor performances. So it's what you learn from those poor performances that make Mm. Going forward. Now, of all your of, of all your races that you've won or lost, which one was the proudest achievement of all of them? Um, I always say if, like the most memorable one. Oh, so actually, mm. no, I was to say proudest achievement was probably winning my first 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 national title. Uh, okay, two thousand and eleven, and there was a lot of pressure because it was at a stage where even though there wasn't many female 400 meter hurdlers there was two of us who were kind of head to head her name was Justine Kinney she's long retired as well um but she had been to the European Championships the year before whereas I was sitting at home watching not having you know any mm. education of going and I I am um, I went into the race and my coach was like the only way you're not going to win this is if Justine beats you you know it was very much she had made okay. it made it's you or her. It's it's, okay, yeah. To her, basically. So you can dictate. You're going to dictate who gets those. And I remember thinking that being so nervous going up against her. But I was in much better shape than I had been. I improved a lot over that year. And I was so determined to beat her that I actually hit the very first hurdle. And I just remember, like, because I was going so fast, I hadn't even fatigued yet. It was the very uh-huh. first I kept it my knee. It was on the back, on the back bend. And I just, what distance, uh, what distance was it? I was the 400 meter hurdles. No, as in where, like oh, in, in, in the race? Only like not even 100 meters into the race. It would have okay. been like just on the back bend. Okay, that, on, the, on, the on the back bend, yeah. Um, so behind like the discus cage. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Whatever cage it was. Um, or the pole vault, then by the pole vault. And I remember just tipping the hurdle and kind of seeing the ground coming towards me. And then I was like, no, not today. And not today. <laughs> nice. That like moment, moment of like, no, I want this. I this is this is mine for the taking. So I ended up winning the race despite that little hiccup. Um, but I suppose the one I always think of as my proudest, proper proudest, and most memorable race was my European uh, European under twenty three final that year, same year as two thousand eleven, and a great year two thousand eleven. It just was the proper breakthrough year, and 
I qualified into the final. Um, there was no semi final, so straight final, uh -huh. heat to final. And I got lane eight, and I thought this is a terrible call. This is terrible. I hate being in lane eight, but actually, it ended up being the best thing ever because I just had my own. It was like I was blinkered. I didn't know where anyone else was. Mm -hmm. I was like the perfect race. It was like the race me and my coach would talk about if everything falls into place, this is the strike pattern you're going to do. This is how it's going to feel. And it did. It was like that race that you, like, it, if I was to say, you know, you've probably heard of the idea of flow and kind of getting to that. Do you know, I was, I was just about to mention like, that. I was just about <laughs> to mention that. Um, if I was to say that there was every time I got into a flow state, it was in that race. Like, okay. okay, it was hard, but like, it didn't feel like it was a struggle. Like, it was okay. like, just fit. It was like, oh, yeah, I was meant to change down at this hurdle. I was meant to do this many strides to this hurdle. And yeah, it just, it was brilliant. And to be but see, it's, it's you see, like the flow state, like a lot of people mm -hmm. talk, a lot of people talk about it, but how can one get into that state? Still, it's, I know it's very hard. It's still a very that I difficult try, one. Yeah. Um, sorry, I just have two seconds. I have a text. Right, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. There's still a lot of research. It's a very hard one. I find it quite hard to grasp because like if you were to ask every single person what they'll have they, they'll have a different answer yeah yeah so also, i mean how do you get into a flow state it's being the most prepared feeling the most prepared feeling the most confident you possibly could so you've left no stone unturned that so you're standing on that start line knowing i'm as ready as i can ever be i know exactly what i need to do i just need to do it and i think that's okay. the only way i believe you could get into that flow state is by knowing when you're on that start line, I've done everything I can. I feel the best I possibly can mentally, physically as well. And all I, all I need to do now is just go ahead and execute. That's probably the best way you can do it. Now, how often you get into that stage, some people may never, you know, I only do it once or twice. So I can only think of probably that and maybe the race, maybe that I got into that state. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hard one to, to chase when we don't really know exactly what it is. Yeah, it is because you, you have some athletes who are very different in terms of personalities. They're very different. Like if you look at, I don't know, uh, Usain Bolt, he's all, like the full race, he's always, uh, you know, boasting and smiling and taunting. And if you look at Michael Phelps, he always has his mm -hmm. earphones in his ear. Same as Conor McGregor as well. Um, yeah. Again, trash, like tra or truth talk or whatever he wants to call it. But um, yeah, so like... It is hard. It's something I've been trying personally as well. Um, this question is, is uh, my friend actually asked me to ask you this question okay. because, it, it, because it relates to the flow state. He basically was asking, well, he asked me first, but I didn't have an answer for it. So I'm going to ask you and see if you have an answer for it. When a coach tells you to work on a certain technique or when you're working on, on a technique, how not to overthink that technique too much where, you, where it goes the other way. Instead of improving, you kind of like again you burn yourself out yeah so i suppose there's a few things like what i'm describing there is probably this idea of like paralysis by analysis which is like right. you overthink something so much that the skill actually starts to break down so like you know if you're able to cycle a bike and you're a good cyclist so you don't really have to think about it. you just get up and you cycle you don't have to think about why you don't fall off or what you do with your hands or like you know whatever the skill is that you're doing and suddenly then someone tells you, or just even like I used to do it, if I do like a, a, a group workshop, I'll demonstrate this with just something so simply, so as simple as walking. So I say, okay, I just want you to walk to the other end of the room and back. Someone does it. Okay, I, okay, yeah. well, exact same thing. But this time I want you to tell me what you're going to do. What are the specific things you're going to do before you do it? And they're like, okay. And I'm like, tell me exactly what you're going to do. They go, well, I, I'm going to lift my knee. And I'm like, yeah, then what? Okay, and then I'm going to, kick my foot out and I'm like yeah okay then what that's only like you haven't even put your foot down oh yeah well, I'm gonna put my foot down okay then what are you gonna do and you can see the person's going I don't know I've never thought about it and then I ask them to walk and they're all kind of stiff and kind of robotic <laughs> but, yeah. because I've yeah. made them think about a skill that's been so conditioned that they've never had to bring it into their consciousness mm. so suddenly a skill that maybe is something that's been picked out with your friend that he has to work on because he's so focused on that the rest of it is kind of forgotten about so may, like maybe having little specific cues so instead of it just thinking what i need to do get low be over my center of gravity what's a one little cue word that i could say to remind myself 
when I'm doing the full technique rather than the whole technique being focused on that one thing. Mm. If you're doing your squat or whatever it is, I'm assuming it's a squat or something, is it? Or what? 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 Sorry, say again? What's the move he's trying to do when he's trying to get low? Is it a squat? Oh, no, it's in acceleration. So he's, oh, I think okay. third step, yeah. Oh, okay. No, 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 so he's squat, sprinting. No, no. Yeah, okay. sprinting, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so then it's having, if you're thinking of that, when you're also trying to sprint, you are, you're, you're, too, you're too focused on one aspect of it. So having one little keyword that reminds him, so maybe if it's hips or it's, you know, whatever part of it, having that little cue, mm -hmm. some visualization, you know, visualizing himself doing it. So maybe if he videos himself doing it and he sees what he's trying to improve, and tries to imagine himself when he's doing it. Okay, I know what it feels like. Now I know what it looks like when I'm doing it wrong. And I've, maybe he's done it right once or twice. I have that video. Or I have other videos of people doing it right. How can I visualize myself doing that? What am, what's different about their hip position to mine? Could I okay. myself tightening up my core? Is that going to bring the hips lower? Whatever it is they're trying to do. There's loads of different little things. It's a tough one to, to answer, but I suppose trying not to break the skill down when they've probably, he's probably been a sprinter for a very long time and now suddenly or yeah uh, if, uh, yeah ish if three if four, a, uh, three four years i said oh, three five, four years is long enough to know yeah to, to know how to do an accelerator yeah. yeah so yeah. then when you try to break it down and you're trying to break down that little skill it can actually if you are if it is something that's kind of glaring be patient that it might actually make you go backwards a little bit until that gets better like, for example, I had to change my blocks technique. I had to actually switch my legs to make sure that I got... Oh, really? Better. Okay. Yeah. And that was after years. That's going to be hard. It was really hard. And for ages, I used to get so frustrated. And it was. It was kind of that having to have patience that, like, you've changed something. Even though it seems small, it was a massive part of my technique. And I, put, I used to focus so much on how my legs and how everything felt awkward coming out of the blocks that I never used to be able to get the first hurdle then. Mm-hmm so frustrated and my coach would just be like look it's gonna feel weird just focus on the hurdle don't focus on what you're trying to change here because all your attentions are that focus on you know once you're coming upright and getting attacking that hurdle and it did it did eventually so maybe it's not trying to pay conscious attention or if you are paying conscious attention acknowledge that this is going to feel weird for a while so if you're trying to change something in your technique be, be patient have your little cue words that remind you so you're not thinking upright, oh, get low, accelerate. You know, you're just thinking hips or something. And then, then you know it's like, that's what I need to do. Look, you could give, I give you five different things. But I get you. You should, you should, if you're not consider being a coach now. <sighs> no. <laughs> I'd have to go back and do a lot of study and I'm still studying psychology. I get you. <laughs> uh, fair enough fair enough no, it, no but that's that's uh, it's a very good analogy anyway and i'm sure he'll appreciate that but um on, on to the next one i just want to talk about athletes in general now yeah mm -hmm. so so when when you deal with athletes what kind of step do you go through when like do you follow any any specific guidelines when you're trying to assessing an athlete do you look at his weakness and um, if an athlete's come to you and said i don't know um he's feeling under pressure or so what are the steps that you will look into the athlete yeah i suppose it depends how long i have with them usually um, okay so you know there's sometimes i've been thrown in the deep end with an athlete in the middle of a season but like mm. really i like to get to know the person behind the athlete as well i find that's really important okay. as as much as you think your performance is on the track like it's important to know the whole person you know what kind of their backstory is as well so i kind of just spend time getting to know the person getting to know you know past experiences in their sport like that most memorable races you know their worst race what made it that what made it so memorable for good and bad reasons okay and, you know because you learn a lot about someone from what they pick you know whether yeah. they only pick the times they've won or they lost or is it i picked that memory because it was a time where like that i felt like i was in flow state and that's why mm. it was this race so, okay you know, even from those oh, okay like then, the reason, yeah, go on. Oh, sorry, go on. No, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> yeah, so I suppose like that's a good starting point, and you just get to know. And it's like psychology is something that you want the person to feel comfortable with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Or I try to dive straight into solving whatever the problem is. Is trying to get to know them, let them know it. Mm. Like hopefully they feel comfortable with me because you know it can be quite personal sometimes. As much yeah. 
Good. That's what I, that's exactly what I was going to get into so because because most athletes here, well, some athletes can't get a sports psychologist. You, do you know what I mean? So they have to rely on the teammates or their coach. So they, at least they have someone to talk. They have someone to talk to about about what's mm. going on in their life. But what happens when you when you have some when you have an athlete or a person that does not want to open up? Like as much as you want to try to help them, they just don't want to feel like open up in, into their lives. How how would you deal with that person? Just be patient, you know, yeah. they're coming back, you know, like you might find that you have someone like that, you have them for a session, you don't see them again. It wasn't for okay. them. But, you know, I don't want to force something on someone because I think psychology is something that's still so new to a lot of people that I wouldn't want someone to come to me, feel like I forced my ideas, try to change something that they weren't willing to be changed in, that they kind of felt when my coach told me to come here. I haven't had many people like that. I've had very few, actually, if I think about it, I've been very lucky. But if I had someone who kind of felt I was, I'm kind of ticking a box here. My coach told me to come see you. And I've got the sense that they weren't going to be engaged. Just chat to them, kind of tell them what I could do. Um, like I said, I, I wouldn't want to force it on someone because if it was something that maybe down the line, they do turn psychology, I would hate for the experience of me to put them off. Okay. So, you know, just kind of maybe, you know, if someone was really closed, I would just kind of say, you know, what is it you want to get out of this? And if they say nothing, well, then I say, okay, well, then you don't have to stay. I haven't been in that situation. I've been very lucky, like I said. Um, usually it's maybe more, if there's anyone who clams up, it's more because it's a shyness more so than they don't want to be there um, is what I found or just kind of that discomfort. So again, just spend time getting to know the person, asking the easy questions. Tell me about your best race. You know, tell me about it. What was it about it? You know, can you remember the feeling of it? And tell me about your worst ever race. People are happy talking about those kind mm. of before it gets any deeper and that's always okay. a starting point it's just making because, that person feel comfortable mm, because i think i don't know from what i've seen well you you, you probably experience different but uh, but from what i've seen from the age i say 15 to 18 that's when i, I would say people are very not shy but they they rather keep stuff to themselves they're not opened up as well i'm trying to be a coach here for my club as well in selbridge but um, there's lots of coaches over there, and I see athletes. Well, I'm not gonna name. I'm not gonna say any names. But like, I can see some athletes that you know you really want to try to help them, but they just don't want to uh, cooperate. So, but by you said, just be be patient. I'm guessing that's the way to go, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I suppose explain where because I think if you can tell an athlete if they're there because they want to get better, if you can ex show ways that coming to see you know what the work that we could do if you were to stick with it for a little while this is how it could potentially benefit your performance and i think if someone wants to get better they will find they will be they'll find a way okay they'll find a way to yeah, yeah. okay yeah that makes so sense trying yeah. to say you know maybe using examples of famous athletes who use psychology you know i i'm i use a lot with mindfulness and i it can be still a bit of a hard sell for some athletes and kind of say look watch the michael jordan documentary watch the last dance they use mindfulness you know, these are a group of, you know, the mm. basketball the top, top, yeah. 90s, you know, and they were using it well before a lot of people were. So it's not something that has to be wishy-washy sitting down going, um, so kind of say, look how it benefited their performance because they felt, you know, in the moment on the, on the course. So using examples of like, this is how this could benefit you if you're willing to work on it. But again, like, S and C like psychology, it's a skill that you have to work on, and sometimes people just don't want to put in that work. That's I get you. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I say so. What's the one lesson you find in uh, when when uh, uh, what's the question? What's one lesson you find it hard to teach an athlete? One lesson. You know what's funny actually is one thing that athletes really struggle with is acknowledging their strengths, acknowledging what they're good at. And um, if I ask it with an athlete and tell them, ask you, to, you know, and the, you know, the automatic. Ooh, sorry, go on, go on. I'll just, sorry, sorry. I'll Am just I getting all sorts of questions? No, 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 I just, no, because everything I was thinking, you already say it. Um, I was listening, yeah. <laughs> I was listening to a podcast yesterday about Jay Shetty. I don't know if you know Jay Shetty, no? Oh, yeah, be aware of him, yeah. Yeah, so he, he released a podcast yesterday and I was listening to it and exactly what he just said. People, not just in sport, in general, people tend to dwell and focus on their weakness. But when you ask them what are the strengths, they don't not like. It's very hard for them mm -hmm. to say it. Or I don't know what like what's the reason. Maybe they think it's egoness. Maybe they think it's 
uh, basically it's based it's based on past experience well that's what I've heard anyway but what's your thoughts on it yeah it's something like think about an Irish mentality is you're modest you know mm. you're an you know oh that's lovely top oh sure it's only cheap oh your hair is lovely oh no Thanks. I have today you know automatically everything that you get a compliment on you're crushing it off and it's the same we don't like to talk about what we're good at and if you are it's like who's that cocky fella like, who, who do you think he is so if I ask it with athletes and you know spend a lot of time work, uh, talking about you know gaps in their in what in their kind of across the board in their performance profile say Mm. The things they want to work on and you could spend ages work looking at that and where are the areas that you need to get better because they know that because you work on it every day you turn up to training to work on weaknesses to get better and then i'm like okay so let's flip it what are you best at and it's like uh and i say you know and there's there's a thing I, I like to do with athletes is um is gathering evidence so i kind of okay. say, scientists now we're trying to prove a theory the theory is whatever their goal is, that maybe you want to be on the podium this summer, you want to win a medal, you want to set a personal best, you want to break a record. Give me all the reasons, all the evidence that you can do that. So which is basically all the positives that they have, not telling me, here's all the things that if I, once I do them, I will get to that goal. It's like, tell me all the reasons why you're tracking towards that goal right now. And it's kind of that, and I'm like, well, you're obviously a good athlete because any athletes that I work with at the Institute are carded, so they're good athletes. Mm. And I'm like, you got to this level by being good. You know, tell me what those strengths are that got you to, to there. And it's it's not a comfortable thing and it does take a bit of time. So, But it's something that's really, really important and it's this kind of strength and focus. It, it's confidence building. So, Jess, I'm, so I'm going to flip back on you. Then you tell me what's your three biggest strength. Yeah, so I would say I have a good kind of emotional intelligence, social intelligence. Um, right. It's actually a thing, if you're interested in it, called the VIA character strength. It's a long questionnaire, and it, has, it gives you, there's 24 strengths on it. What, what, what is it? It's something, if you're interested in it, it's called the VIA character strengths. So it's like through a university, I can't remember which one, I've done it a while yeah. ago, cool. kind of psychology um, thing. But I actually did that, so I kind of am pretty aware of what my strengths are, and I kind of have known anyway. So it's a kind of emotional, social intelligence. So I'm good at you know working with people, understanding when there's a change in their emotion, and um, you know kind of recognizing a difference in that kind of sense. And mm -hmm. it's what drew me to the job that I'm in anyway, and um, why I like working with people. I like I'm I'm probably quite in tune to noticing when someone's emotions have changed, and. Um, I am kind of very, I would believe in kind of fairness. So this is actually something again that came from that strength and it wasn't, okay. I was like, oh, and then when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, you know, why, why should, you know, I think everyone should have the same access to, you know, it used to really annoy me when the carding, being a carded athlete meant you had more access to services. So I remember if I wasn't carded, you know, I would have had much more. What's, what's carded? So it's institute, it's the support. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah Government supported yeah, athletes. Yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. the carding scheme, they call it. So I remember thinking, God, if I wasn't, you know, on the carding scheme, I wouldn't be able to get physio, you know, because the physios are all booked up for weeks. Why is that fair? You know, there's, it's actually the people who, who need all those services the most are the ones who aren't on it. Because once you're at a certain level, you're probably good enough anyway. And then mm -hmm. you get thrown at you. And that used to really annoy me. Um, same with all the funding and stuff. Everything gets to the people who've already kind of, are at the stage they probably don't need it as much as the people who are kind of getting there but yeah. then there has to be a cut off where you but i remember it used to annoy me i was like it's the people who are just on the cusp that need the support that can't get it and the people who can probably go into any physio they're probably the ones you know they have access to everything so that was me as an athlete now working in it i understand that you can't give the the you know services to everybody, give it to everybody yeah, yeah. Only people. but yeah so i think something that you know, I see maybe that kind of see, recognize that there should be more fairness. Okay. Other strengths, and number three? Yeah, other strengths would be, I suppose, resilience. I'll put that yeah, in. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, that, very good. It's, I've carried it from my career in athletics. Um, you know, I'm probably 
learning how to apply it more to my career because I knew how to apply resilience to rehab and to training and to not giving up. Well, now I'm like sitting in front of a laptop. How does that apply? But I know it does. Mm. So, yeah, because yeah. Uh, because I was I was listening to the podcast again. Um, he was saying I was uh, I'm talking about Jay Shetty. He was saying so <laughs> instead of thinking about being busy, just think about being productive. That will switch everything. So. Well, people say they're busy. That's more of a, it's not negative, but it's just, it's a, it's an emotion that really don't move you forward. But when you think that you bring, you're being productive, that kind of helps you to go forward. It, uh, again, that's what he said anyway. So do you listen to much podcasts actually? I do. Yeah. I listen to um, it, any, I any, any recommendations? recommendations? Yes, I have. So if you're interested in sports psychology specific ones, there's one called the sports psychology. I think that's just the sports psychology podcast. Okay. Beside me. Um, so that's just, uh, he's a sports psychologist himself and he interviews not just sports psychologists, he interviews coaches. Don't think there's been any athletes. It's mainly kind of coaches, performance directors, and mostly people who work in kind of psychology kind of. Okay. Those kind of influential fields. Yeah, the sports psych show. With Danny. All right. Sport. That's a really yeah. good if you're interested in sports psychology. Um, the high performance mindset, which is with um Cindra Kampoff. Now I will say she has a quite a high pitched American voice. Um her accents can get a little bit grating. I will say that if you listen to her for an hour, but her content is very good and she interviews I'll manage. Her. Yeah. She's um oh she's got hundreds of episodes. I think she's got maybe three okay. um who has the performance fix. So it's performance fix yeah i follow them on instagram actually yeah yeah they're very good yeah yeah um yeah they're kind of my main ones believe perform radio but they haven't done anything in ages the high performance podcast i mean if you type in performance high performance podcast is a good Mm. one um yeah they'd be kind of my main kind of psyche ones and then i like to listen to um true crime which is not going to help anyone to switch off (laughs) i get you i get you Yeah. yeah but now you have another one the sufi show there you go what yeah. platform can I follow you on? That, YouTube. I, I, have, hey, I, have a, I have a spot. No, I have a Spotify. But I haven't uploaded much on Spotify. Everything is on YouTube, though. So, um, okay. so um, sports uh, psych, uh, psychology is the first one that you said, yeah? And high performance. High performance mindset. We're all very sports psychology heavy, but there's some, they get some really good uh, people on. Okay. Perform. That's another one, actually, that it was a performance. It wasn't psychology blah, 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 psychology specific it was just outperform um so they have had anything from sports psychologists there was a guy who specialized in like breathing techniques people from the military coaches and it was people from business as well it wasn't sports specific it was just performance across the board so you, you there was such a range and you, i just kind of dipped in and out i didn't listen to every single one but have, those- have, it, have yeah have you ever thought of doing a podcast yourself no, um, I haven't because, yeah, I just haven't really, to be honest. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, what about what about writing a book? No, 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 no. I'm trying to finish a PhD at the moment, so I'll get that. Okay, from. all right. No, but no, but somewhere down the line, though, no? maybe. Uh, maybe. In the future, I'm probably not yes. a book, but no, I definitely like the idea of maybe blogs or podcasts where yeah. the commitment is kind of it's more interactive and stuff, and there's not the commitment to. A book that I get you. Forever. Not that it, not, it doesn't matter if it's out there forever, but I like the interactive nature of a podcast and these kind of things. Mm, yeah, same, same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, uh, Jess. We are almost one hour into the podcast, so we're gonna play a little game. That's what I've been recently doing in my recent podcast. So there's three rounds. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. So the first round is a quick fire round. So I'm gonna say one word, and you can only reply with one word. Okay. okay. Like a word Don't, association kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's basically so I so I stole this idea from from Joey in Friends. I don't know if it's oh, okay. worth. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's okay. Solid source. Yeah. Okay. So, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, athletic. Athletic. Yeah. No questions, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Oh yeah. No, I was athletic or athletics. Athletic. Uh... Anything. Anything. Or- what sport oh okay yeah. i was gonna say body and then i was like no body why would you say body Athletic image like athletic body oh, okay okay fair enough yeah. um 
Thomas. Bar. <laughs> Easy. Sport. Psychology. Okay. 400 meter. Hurdles. Ireland. Great. I like that. Mindset. Important. Friends. I missed them. I know it's three words. <laughs> <laughs> One word. Missed. Uh, miss. Yeah. Okay. So um, Lily. Lily. Yeah. Bestie. <laughs> I like that. Um, Sufi. Podcast. That's it. I was expecting more than that, but <clears throat> okay. Erica, fab hair. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not this game, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was round one. Now we're gonna move okay. to round two. Round two okay. is would you rather? Okay, yeah. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Would you rather win an, a gold Olympic medal or be mm -hmm. the best uh, sports psychologist in the world? Gold Olympic medal. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure the people at work will <laughs> like that answer, but. <laughs> I think they'd um, agree if they were in the same boat. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, number two, would you rather get rid of Paul or Lily? What? Would you rather get rid of Paul or, or Lily? Oh, that is so... I don't know <laughs> Paul and Lily. You have to pick one. Oh, I'd have to get rid of Paul. Really? <laughs> take, take, take that ring out of your hands. <laughs> Rip that ring off. <laughs> um... Uh, number three, would you rather know how you will die or when you will die? When. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I say the same. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Otherwise, if I knew how, I'd be avoiding whatever that way is. Ah, uh, true. True. That, that, that'd be bought. Yeah, that would be mm. just a waste of time. Yeah. No. Um, would, you, would you rather have a head size of tennis ball or the head size of a watermelon? Ah. Uh, Watermelon? Do I look less weird? Tennis ball size? Yeah. Very small. Ten, yeah, too small. Yeah, I say watermelon because you have um, you have different types of watermelon. So a tennis ball is only one shape. So there you go. Uh, would you rather freeze to death or burn to death? Oh, I've had this. We've had this question before. Um, freeze sounds less painful, but I hate being cold. No, I say burn would be more painful. That's what I'm saying. Freeze would probably be less painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I hate being cold, but good, let's go with freeze. Hmm. Yeah, because you won't feel, you just be, yeah, you'll feel all you your might, I might be, I might just actually be frozen and wake back up when I go off again. Oh, so you're Captain America now, huh? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, last one for this round. Would you rather have a time machine that uh, that goes back in time, or have a time machine that goes forward in time? Uh forward. Yeah. Any particular reason? Um, I like to give the. I, I like to kind of practice what I preach and say we can't do anything about what's happened and trying not and going back over it is not helpful. But I I would love to know what's to come. Okay, okay, I like that. Okay, now we're on to the last round, Jess, round number three. For the round number three, it's basically answer the question, so don't overthink again, just whatever comes to your head. It's just mm -hmm. simple questions, okay? So the, so the first one would be, uh, given the choice of anybody in the world, who would, you rather, who would you rather take as a dinner guest? Dead or alive, or? Um, yeah, dead or alive. Anybody. <laughs> Be really soppy now and actually say my granddad. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. When I was ten, so I would love to see. I would love because he. I was not a good athlete when he passed away. I'd love him to see now what I've become. So. Um. What What would you like to be remembered for? Um. I would like to be remembered for being someone, whether a psychologist or not, who helped people, help people posit in a positive way. So whether it was as a sports psychologist or not, just someone who people kind of say, yeah, she, I definitely found my experience with her to be a really positive one. Okay, very good. I like that. That's very vague, but 
you know. No, I, so mine's going to be Everyone's fairly similar to that, yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. I like that. Um, what have you learned about yourself in, to, in 2020? 2020? Yeah. Um, I'm actually very good in my own company because <laughs> I've had to spend okay. a with COVID and it's actually something that I kind of knew anyway, but I'm actually quite good at just being on my own, which is probably okay. ill in itself. Oh, on your own? I, I, I thought you, in, you had a company. Okay. okay. No, no, no. As oh, in yeah. being in my own personal company. So spending a lot of time on my own um, doesn't really bother me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think I've learned that this year because I think a lot of people have either yeah. learned they didn't like it or learned that actually it's not so bad. And I found that it wasn't so bad. I'm good okay. at keeping myself busy. Very good. Very good. Um, next question would be, what's the one question you find yourself asked the most? Um, it can be anything relating to sports, just in life, just anything. <laughs> usually something to do with athletics and it's usually kind of like how I got into it how I stuck with it you know what are your biggest lessons it's usually something to do with that or did you meet Usain Bolt would you beat your brother in a race (laughs) really a lot of talks for kids okay yeah did you want yeah Yeah, go on no go on I'm just gonna say usually if I was to think of in general it would usually be how did you get into athletics? What's kept you in it for so long? Okay. I was, I was going to say, you met uh, uh, Professor Powell, haven't you? I did. How was that? And he asked you out for a dinner thing? <laughs> you know a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes, he was, I was commentating at the AFC Grand Prix a few years ago. Um, the year he competed, was meant to compete in the because he was injured. Um, and yeah, I was, I was chatting to his physio, who's Irish, who I knew, Kieran. Okay. He came over and he was like, oh, so where are you taking me for dinner? And I was like, um, McDonald's. <laughs> that, that was very smooth. When you were in the area. That was, <laughs> that was very smooth. Fair play then. Um, okay, so last question, Jess. Last question. Um, so I usually ask this for every single person that's been on my podcast. And it is, what's one thing that we can do to make the world a better place? Just be kinder. Um, be kinder to ourselves be kinder to others Um, you know there's a lot going on at the moment that's kind of testing people's kindness levels and I think people are realizing maybe you know maybe even myself included times where maybe I could have been better Um, so kindness showing kindness to everyone regardless and then showing that kindness to yourself as well perfect I love that answer 